Trigonometry is a subject that is traditionally taught as being the study of angles and triangles. While it is true that this is how the subject was discovered historically, these days we use ideas from trigonometry in many other areas that have little to do with geometry. While learning trigonometry, students might be asking questions like, why is this so important? And why do we use radians instead of degrees? As students start learning more, they might start asking other questions such as, why does this stuff pop up in non-geometric applications? And why does pi pop up everywhere? All of these questions arise because thinking of trigonometry in terms of triangles and angles is only telling one side of the story. In this video, I will be introducing some of the fundamental ideas of trigonometry, but in a way that hopefully answers all of these questions. So instead of talking about triangles and angles, I want to talk about oscillations. There are many examples of oscillations, such as a mass on a spring, a pendulum, or a vibrating string. In physics and engineering, oscillations show up in a surprising number of situations. They are so important that it is extremely useful to know the math behind how they work. It turns out that the math behind these and many other examples of oscillations is identical in many cases. Thus, we can study just one of these examples and we will learn a lot about oscillations in general. The simplest of these examples is the spring, so let's focus on understanding springs. Why does a spring move like this? The reason is that there is a certain position that the spring wants to be in. If the spring is pushed to this point and released, it will not move. We call this position the equilibrium position. If we push the spring in, the spring would push itself out to try to get back to its original state. However, when it gets back to the equilibrium position, it still has plenty of leftover speed from getting pushed to this point, so it ends up overshooting and going past the equilibrium position. At this point, the spring starts pulling the other way which eventually causes it to stop at a point past the equilibrium position. After this, the spring starts pulling back towards the middle again, but it once again overshoots. In an ideal situation, this pulling and overshooting continues indefinitely, causing an oscillation. This demonstrates the fundamental idea behind oscillations. Oscillations occur when something gets pulled towards a single spot. This is the central idea behind oscillations, and we will be appealing to it several times throughout the video. Also, in many situations, such as with the spring, the amount that things are pulled towards the equilibrium position is directly proportional to the distance to the equilibrium position. Oscillations have two main properties. The first is the size or extent of the movements. We could have another spring that moves much less than the first one. To measure the size of the movements, we usually use the distance between the equilibrium position and one of the ends of the oscillation. This distance is called the amplitude. The second property that oscillations have is how fast they're moving. We could have another spring that moves at a much slower rate than the first one. There are a few different ways to specify this speed. One way is to measure how long one full cycle of the oscillation takes. You could use a stopwatch to see that the spring on the left takes 2 seconds to go through one full cycle, and the spring on the right takes 4 seconds to go through one full cycle. We call this time that it takes to do one full cycle the period of the oscillation. Before we start looking at the math behind this situation in detail, let's explore the simulation a bit more. Let's say that this distance that we push the spring to is exactly one unit. I earlier said that with a spring, the amount the spring is pulled to the center is directly proportional to the displacement. To make things simpler, let's say that the amount the spring is pulled is actually equal to the displacement. To be precise, when the distance is one unit, we'll say that the acceleration is one unit per second squared. Notice that by setting the magnitude of the acceleration equal to the magnitude of the displacement, we are describing the most natural scenario, mathematically speaking. One other important value to watch is the velocity. Again, to make things simple, let's choose the starting velocity to be zero. I will also show the time, in seconds, on the right. Now that we have all of these details worked out, let's run the simulation.
The first thing you might notice is that this is actually moving pretty slowly. That's because if you have a spring where the magnitude of the acceleration is equal to the magnitude of the displacement, in reality, it is actually a rather weak spring. With that out of the way, there are a few things that I want to point out about this simulation. First, we see that the displacement velocity and acceleration are all oscillating at the same rate as the spring. Second, as designed, you can see that the acceleration is always pointing exactly opposite to the displacement, and they both have the same magnitude. Another thing I want to look at is the amplitude of these three values. The amplitude of the displacement is 1, because that's how far we initially brought the spring. Since the acceleration is set to the same value as the displacement, the amplitude of the acceleration is also 1. However, while we haven't specified any constraints on the velocity, looking at the simulation, the velocity's amplitude is also 1. This will be a useful fact to remember. Finally, I want to talk about the period of this oscillation. Let's rewind time back to the start. Remember that the period is the time it takes for one full oscillation to happen. This number is actually going to be much more important than you might initially think, so we should give it a name. Because it represents a duration of time, we will use the Greek letter tau to represent the period. How long does it take to get the spring back to this position? Well, after waiting one second, it actually hasn't moved very far. If we wait a couple more seconds, it's still not even fully at the other side yet. If we wait for three more seconds, it still hasn't quite reached the start yet. But if we wait another second, we overshoot. So it seems like tau is somewhere between 6 and 7. Unlike the amplitude, the period is not a simple number. Now, what would happen if we started over but made our starting push smaller? After releasing, we see that the spring is still oscillating in a similar manner as before. What's the period this time? Let's go back to the beginning. As we increase the time, we see that the spring reaches the top again at the same time as before, at some value between 6 and 7. Interestingly, the period is independent of the amplitude and is once again tau. This number seems to be a vitally important constant being the period of the simplest oscillation possible, where the magnitude of the acceleration is equal to the magnitude of the displacement. Now that we've played around with this simulation a bit, let's try to study this situation in more detail. Starting over again, let's think of the displacement of the oscillation as being a function of time and try to graph it. The input will be the time, while the output will be the displacement. We know that the displacement starts at 1. Let's now let time pass and plot the function. Now that we have this function, we can forget about the spring and just consider the function on its own. While we're at it, let's forget that we were talking about time and displacement and just consider this to be a pure mathematical function. Also, it's useful to let the function have negative inputs. Because the function repeats, we can do this by continuing this repetition backwards. This function shows up basically any time you have an oscillation, so it is an incredibly important function. For historical reasons, we call this function the cosine. Some people, instead of starting at 1 with no speed, prefer to start at 0 with some speed. We could do this by shifting the function to the right. This version of the cosine that starts at 0 is called the sine. Because we saw in the simulation earlier that the amplitude of the velocity of the spring was 1, the speed of the sine is 1 when the input is 0. This fact will be important later in the video, so keep it in mind. When writing these functions in equations, we often write the sine and the cosine using these three-letter abbreviations. These functions are the central focus of trigonometry, so they are called trigonometric functions. While there are other trigonometric functions that are often used, such as the tangent, we won't be needing them in this video. All of the other trigonometric functions can be derived from the sine and the cosine. Now you might notice that I haven't said how we actually calculate these functions. To do so requires a bit of calculus, and since people usually learn trigonometry before calculus, I want to avoid using calculus in this video.
I'll put a note in the description of this video saying how to use calculus to calculate these functions if you're interested. Thankfully, most computers and calculators have the sine and the cosine built in, and you can just use those to evaluate these functions. So what can we do with this kind of function? Well, like other functions, we can shift it by adding numbers to various parts of the equation. Also, we can easily change the amplitude by multiplying the function by that amplitude. We can also change the period by multiplying x by some value. Here, by multiplying x by 2, we have cut the period in half. Speaking of the period, remember that we earlier called the period of the spring tau. Because this function was made from the spring, the period of this function is tau as well. From this graph, we can get a slightly better idea of what the value of tau is. The point that the graph reaches 1 again is here, and we can see that this point is around 6.3, so tau is approximately 6.3. At this point, one question you might be asking yourself is how does this relate to angles and triangles? To answer this question, we need to look at an interesting example of oscillations, circles. While you might not have ever thought of circles as oscillations, think about moving along a circle. When moving along a circle, we always come back to where we started and continue repeating, so this is kind of like an oscillation. In fact, if we think of a situation where circles arise naturally, such as the Earth orbiting the Sun, the circle exists because the Earth is always getting pulled towards the Sun. This is precisely the fundamental idea behind oscillations that I mentioned earlier in the video. Even though it looks different because it is two-dimensional rather than one-dimensional, this is definitely an example of an oscillation. To make the connection with what we've learned so far more precise, let's start the motion at the right side of the circle and say that the radius of the circle is 1. We call this circle the unit circle. Assuming the center of the circle is at the origin, let's now plot the x and y coordinates of this point as it travels around the circle. Now, these functions might look familiar. That's because it turns out that these functions are precisely the sine and the cosine. So going back to the circle, we can represent the points on the unit circle using the sine and the cosine. Now, if we think of starting at the right, notice that every input to the sine and the cosine corresponds to an arc on the circle. Because of the one-to-one -one correspondence between these arcs and the angles made by the arcs, we can measure angles by finding what input we need for the sine and the cosine to get this arc. This creates a unit for angle measurement that we call the radian. Notice that there were no arbitrary decisions in deriving this unit for angles, so radians are a much more natural unit for angles than something like degrees, where we arbitrarily split one full turn into 360 degrees. With radians, one full turn is tau radians, which makes sense because one full turn represents one full oscillation, and tau is the natural period of oscillations. Describing angles with radians in terms of tau makes intuitive sense as well. An eighth of a circle is tau over eight radians, a quarter of a circle is tau over four radians, a half of a circle is tau over two radians, etc. There are still a couple of things we can learn from this circle. Given some angle, we can make a vertical line segment here to create a right triangle. Because we know that the coordinates of the top right point of the triangle are given by the sine and cosine of the angle, the lengths of these sides of the triangle are given by the sine and cosine as well. Because the radius of the circle is 1, we know that the length of the hypotenuse is 1 as well. Forgetting about the circle for a moment, let's focus on just this triangle. If we multiply the length of every side by some value c, we get another similar triangle. Now if we call the lengths of the two legs a and b, we can get equations that relate certain sides of the triangle with the sine and the cosine of this angle. We can also rearrange these equations to express the sine and cosine in terms of ratios of sides of the triangle, which is the definition that students usually encounter first. Now there's one more important point that I want to make before finishing this video. Let's go back to the circle. The question I want to ask now is, what is the speed at which we travel around the circle when using the sine and cosine? Consider the speed at the start, which we say is at the right side of the circle. 
Just how fast are we moving at this point? Well, remember from before that the speed of the sine at zero is one. Furthermore, the speed of the cosine at zero is zero. Because the sine and the cosine correspond to the y-coordinate and the x-coordinate respectively, the speed in the y-direction is one and the speed in the x-direction is zero. Putting these together, the velocity points straight up with a magnitude of one. Now as time increases, the direction of the velocity is changing, but notice that it still seems to be moving at the same rate the whole time. Thus, while moving around the circle, the speed is always one. We can use this fact to start measuring distances along the circle. For example, if we wait one second, the length of this arc is one unit because we traveled for one second at a rate of one unit per second. If we wait for another second, the total distance traveled would be two, so the length of this arc is two. Now because tau is the natural period of oscillations, after waiting for a total of tau seconds, we will be back where we started. Because it took us tau seconds to get here at a rate of one, the total distance traveled is tau. This shows us that the circumference of the circle is tau. Wait a minute. We already know that the circumference of a circle is two pi times the radius, and since the radius here is one, the circumference is two pi. This means that tau equals two pi. This answers the question of why pi shows up so much in math and physics. It is half the natural period of oscillations. Because oscillations show up in a surprising number of phenomena, pi ends up showing up in all of those situations as well. But wait, pi is only half of the full period. If the idea behind pi is its relationship to the period of oscillations, shouldn't we be using tau, not pi? As we've seen in this video, using tau instead of pi is more simple, efficient, and logical. Thus, I would say that the answer to this question is yes, we should use tau instead of pi. The point of pi is its relationship to the natural period of oscillations, so we should just use that period itself, not half of it. While I think that this observation alone is enough to justify using tau instead of pi, there are many more reasons for us to do this. This video would get too long if I listed all of these reasons. Thankfully, someone else has already done so. The Tau Manifesto, written by Michael Hartle, showcases many of the reasons to use tau instead of pi. If you want more information on this subject, I would suggest reading the Tau Manifesto. I'll link to it in the description. With all of this said, I am going to be using tau instead of pi in all of my future videos whenever the need arises. I hope that you will join me in using tau.